صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين Respected scholars, elders, brothers, sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have again been given this golden opportunity to meet up on a blessed night of Laylatul Jumu'ah. Thursday night, which is the Laylatul Qadr of the week. And it's also in a blessed month, the month of Sha'aban, the month of the Prophet. And it's just a few days away from the holy month of Ramadan. So Alhamdulillah, we, are, we should consider ourselves to be fortunate enough to have been given this chance it's a night of ibadah, but also scholars tell us that one of the best acts on this night is to gain knowledge, to share knowledge, and improve our own ma'rifah. Uh, with the happenings around the world just now, the political situation, uh, a gathering like this would be an ideal setup to discuss politics of the world. I don't know what you had in mind when you saw the topic, uh, the economic corridors. Some people must have thought that we are going to discuss some ways of improving the economy or our own economy or maybe making money. Uh, if that was your thought process, I'm sorry. I'm not a businessman, neither am I an economist. But uh, my aim was to discuss the happenings around the world and have a better understanding. As you might have seen in the news, there is a global awakening, a collective awakening of the human consciousness after seeing what is happening in Gaza. It's a very unique war. We are seeing oppression that we have not seen before. But it's also unique because we are seeing resistance that we've never seen before. So we have two extremes on either side. But not only that, what is also unique about this conflict is what we can see. So we hear of the brutalities of the Second World War, but they, we didn't have the media that we have today the mainstream media and the alternative media. And because of this, we can see things happening in Gaza in real time or recorded. The brutality, the day-to-day -day happenings, you have the independent journalists, journalists themselves being killed. And because of what people have seen globally, there's a global, there's a collective awakening of the fitra, of the human consciousness the way we've been wired. Everybody innately loves good, loves kindness, and hates cruelty. And this was manifested in the emulation of Aaron Bushnell. For those of you who saw the clip the other day, the active American Air Force uh, personnel or a soldier goes outside the Israeli embassy and burns himself. But before that, he says that I'm going to do something very extreme just to bring an awakening of the people, of people who are going to watch it. And people would ask, why is he doing this? And as a result, the answer would come again from, from Gaza. And he would say, that what I've gone through is nothing compared to what the children and women and the people of Gaza are going through. 
Unfortunately, this part of the world, we haven't been able to do much. But the least, the least we can do is at least raise a level or rise a level in our awareness that we have about the situation and maybe study the analysis and try to know what is happening. That would be the first step. And as a, resu as a result, make an effort not to be on the wrong side of history. So the topic of discussion is economic corridors. Economics, we all know, Uchumi, Kwakiswahili. Uh, it is a bar by which the success of a government is judged or the success of a country is judged. So it is a criteria. If the economy is good, a country is successful. And the leader is also considered to be successful. Corridors, I don't know the Swahili word for corridor. What is a corridor in Kiswahili? Ukumbi? If I got the word right, Ukumbi? So it is the path that connects the rooms. It is the path that connects the rooms. A corridor is a long passage in a building with doors and rooms on one or both sides. So if you're in a house, you would have a corridor, Ukumbi. Yeah, so you have a room and another room, but the path that connects it is called a corridor. Ukumbi, yeah? Asan. There's also another definition. A corridor is a strip of land that connects one country to another or it gives a route to the sea through another country. So if you notice in this definition, the sea has been mentioned. And sea is what, it's a vital point for the economy of any country. Why? Because 80% of the movement of goods from one country to the other or from different parts of the globe. 80% is through maritime route, through the sea. So it is vital for any country, for its economy to have access to the sea, <laughs> either directly or indirectly. But not only the sea, but within the sea you have the ships which we take very lightly. Oh, it's just floating. But Allah mentions it in, in the Quran so many times. So Surah Luqman, for example, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Alam tara anna al-fulka tajri fi al-bahri bi ni'matillahi li yuriyakum min ayatih. Have you not regarded that the ship sail at sea with Allah's blessing that he may show you some of his signs? There are indeed signs in that for every patient and grateful servant. Very interesting, there are several verses which talk about ships and this patience and gratefulness has been mentioned. So the floating of ships, it may be a principle of physics, a common question that they would ask you in physics, why does a needle sink and why does a ship float? Something as light as a needle sinks, and why does a ship float? These are principles of physics. But Allah says, with nothing but my blessings. And in this, you should take lesson and have a lot of patience. The maritime route requires a lot of patience. If you've gone by boat, it's not the fastest of routes. You have to have a lot of patience. There are weather conditions that it's dependent on. And there's a lot of thankfulness involved. When you reach your destination, you're truly thankful. For those of you who have gone through a flood or a storm at sea, if you've gone through the big waves, when you reach land, automatically, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. If you've gone through to Zanzibar and the sea was very rough, or when you're coming back by the last boat, when you reach the port here, you're like, Alhamdulillah, we made it safely. It's scary. So you have to be patient, it takes time. Flight is 20 minutes, by ship is one and a half to two hours. So definitely a little bit longer and it's a bit rough. So you have to have patience and you have 
to have gratefulness, but it's a sign of Allah, we should be aware of it. So just to get into the topic, so we are talking about corridors. So it's a way, a path that connects two lands or two countries or a path that gives you access to the sea. So let's start with something closer to home. Alhamdulillah, we are Tanzanians and we living in Tanzania, we don't realize this, but Tanzania is a big corridor for so many countries around it. So Tanzania and Kenya are literally competing to assist the countries that are behind them. So one side you have Uganda, you have Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, Zambia, Malawi. These are all landlocked countries. They don't have access to the sea. And most of them come through Tanzania. So you must have heard of transit goods. Bulk of the goods that come through our port here are transit goods, be it cars, be it oil, or whatever. And Tanzania and Kenya are competing. So Tanzania is a corridor now, it's an economic corridor. And you can earn so much. The whole economy can just run on a port. So the politics of the port that was happening recently, you know why it's happening. People are fighting for that opportunity to make an extra buck. So this was one example. For those of you, so before we go into that, I'll just take you back to this map of Tanzania. You've heard of the pipeline. So there's oil that has been discovered in, in Uganda, uh, in Lake Albert in Uganda. So, so much of oil in Uganda, but they can't take it anywhere. It either has to go through Kenya or it has to go through Tanzania. So the pipeline that is being laid now from Lake Albert all the way to Tanga port. And Tanzania is going to get a commission from that. So now Tanzania is becoming an economic corridor. It's called the ECOP, EACOP, East African Crude Oil Pipeline. So this was just uh, an example. Another example, which is very interesting for those of you who are following the news, one of the fastest growing economies in Africa is Ethiopia. And it was going at a very, very rapid rate until the Tigray war that they had to go through, a civil war that slowed them down. But an economy that is growing very fast. But a problem that they have is it is landlocked. So you have Eritrea right on the north there. This was part of Ethiopia, but it sought independence and it's become independent. So this was its access to the Red Sea. So that is not there anymore. And they say the boundary of Ethiopia, the whole boundary of Ethiopia is within 200 miles of the sea, but it doesn't have access to the, to the sea. So fast growing economy and you don't have access to the sea. So what you have to do is you have to offload a big chunk of what you earn to a country to give you access to the sea. So in this case, Ethiopia has been using Djibouti. And they've been giving them almost 10% of their GDP just to have access to the, to the sea. So now they have to think of an alternative. If you're paying so much money, Eritrea, we don't want to, they're not our friends. They've already have, they've had a war with Eritrea. So he says it'll make us too vulnerable. We should not be using Eritrea. So what they did was, you have Somalia on this side, if you see on the map. There is civil war and instability in the whole of Somalia. But this area here, Somali land, is absolutely peaceful. Life is going on as usual. In fact, it's prospering. Somaliland. It is part of Somalia, but it's very peaceful compared to the rest of the country. And what they're trying to do now is Somaliland is trying to separate itself from the main Somalia, but it's not getting recognition. 
the African Union is not giving it recognition. So they're desperate for recognition. And if you get recognized, then you have access to bank loans from the IMF or World Bank. So they are not getting that, but they have access to the sea. So Addis Ababa, so Ethiopia, has struck a deal with Somaliland. He said, we will recognize you. And you give us a strip of land, a small strip of land, up to Berbera. Berbera is a port town, a coastal town there. So you give us a small pathway up to the sea. So they signed a deal of 50 years, that for 50 years you give us this corridor, it's an economic corridor. You give us access to the sea. In return, we will recognize you one, but more importantly, we'll give you shares in Ethiopian Airlines. Ethiopian Airlines is the most successful African airline, and they're doing really well compared to all the other airlines around the world. So he says, we're going to give you shares in Ethiopian Airlines. This just shows how important an economic corridor is, access to the sea. And the rest of Somalia is going wild now. The government in Somalia is like, no, this is not independent land. You, should, you can't be negotiating with them. The Americans are getting wild. I don't know if they're really wild, but they are pretending maybe. I don't know. But there's something going on. But this deal has almost been signed. It was January 2024, for those of you who read newspapers. So Tanzania, Ethiopia, very close to where we are, just to give you an idea of what an economic corridor is. It's vital for the economy of a country. So now let's discuss another economic corridor. I'll take you back to your geography classes in secondary school. So you have South America and you have North America. And there's a small country there, Panama. You have the Atlantic Ocean and you have the Pacific Ocean here. But this is all land. So if you had to transport something from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of United States, remember I mentioned 80% of the cargo is transported by sea. So you can transport it by lorries if you want, but one container at a time. But if you have one ship, you can imagine the number of containers that go through. So just from the east of United States, east coast to the west coast, they would have had to go all the way around South America up to the west coast. This is almost 13,000 miles, 20,900 kilometers. But what they did was they created a small man-made strait there, an economic corridor again. It's called the Panama Canal. So now, from 20,900 kilometers, you just have to travel 5,200 miles or 8,300 kilometers. 20,000, 8,000. And the time that is saved. So if you have to go all the way around, it will take you 10 days. This would just take you 11 hours to cross. So amazing, a human corridor. So this opened in 1914, and according to contractors, we have a contractor here in the audience. So contractors term this to be one of the seven wonders of the world. The Panama Canal is one of the seven wonders of the world. If you want to see the heights of human intelligence, or what humans can achieve when they apply their intellect, you should see the Panama Canal. So we'll come to that. But 1914, it was opened. Its length is 82 kilometers. And we'll see how it works. But coming to the political part of it, because it's so vital, this path, United States said, we are not going to let it go. Although it is in Panama, but we are going to own this place because it's very vital. 1977, Omar Torrios, who was the head of Panama at that time, we discussed about him when we are discussing the confessions of an economic hitman. 
So he was the one who said, okay, we should get something. It's, this path is running through our country, Panama. It's running through our country. We should get something out of it. You can't be taking everything from it. So they started negotiating until Carter, Jimmy Carter and Torrios sat together and a contract was made in 1977. <coughs> so partially managed by Panama, but the political and foreign policy of the canal was still managed by the US. And then 1999, Panama took control. But in 1989, there was a big war there. So it's in the interest of the US to have a government there which is very compliant to the US policies. So 1989, they had a, their own person there who was a drug dealer. Noriega, is it Noriega? Manuel Noriega, is it? I think so. Yes. So he was a drug dealer, but he was placed, and then he went against his masters. So one fine day, the US just attacked. They went in, took over the country, ousted him, extradited him to the US, took over the country, and then later on put their own government there. So it's very important. It's in the interest of the US to have a government that is compliant to the US policies in a vital economic corridor there. So what I'm trying to say is economic corridors, they run the economy, but it has big political implications. The political decisions that have to be made to maintain this political, this economic corridor. Another incident is the Dina and Makran warships, Iranian warships. They decided to go around the world. You must have heard about it sometime last year. So homemade defense warships made by Iranians themselves. And they set sail from Iran going eastwards. And they made only six stops, but they went around the globe. The problem came in when they reached here. And they kept on threatening that we are going to go through the Panama Canal. And the US was like, you'll never go through the Panama Canal. So it was like rubbing a person on his nose. It's like an ant tickling a bear on the nose. Okay, let's see what you do. Because United Nations has already said, everybody has a right to go through this canal. As long as you pay the toll, and I'll tell you how much it costs. The toll, you know, we are used to, when you cross the bridge here, how much do we pay? 1,500 shillings? 1,500 shillings to cross. Or Kigamboni, people pay 200 shillings, or a car pays 1,500. So it says, as long as you pay the toll, and you are at peace with everybody, you're allowed to cross. So the government of Panama came and said, we will allow Iranians to go through. We will allow them. The U.S. were up in arms. These ships are not going to go, they're not going to go through. So Iranians came very close by here, and then they changed the route. They went round, and they went to Brazil, and they continued with their journey. So a bit of threatening, and then they just went. So they did not go through the Panama Canal, but they went around the world, which was an achievement on its own. But just to 5% of all maritime routes or cargo around the world pass through the Panama Canal. So from the US to China, from China back to the east coast of the US, from the US and Canada down to South America, all these ships use this Panama Canal. And it's vital. And you know how much it costs per ship, per vessel to cross? Up to $260,000. Every vessel has, has to pay up to $260,000 as toll to go through this canal. And there's a waiting time. So there are so many ships waiting because only one ship can go at a time. Now they've expanded. So there's a waiting time and some ships pay a bribe. So if you have urgent cargo and you want your turn to come first, you can pay an official bribe and go through. So the record is $3 million. 
a Japanese ship paid $3 million in bribes so that their turn comes first and they get to cross. Even if you swim, if you decide to swim, you have to pay a toll in this canal. So I don't know if this video will play. I just wanted to see how the canal works. So you, you have the Atlantic Ocean on one side, and you have the Gatun Lake, which is 26 meters higher than the ocean. It's up in the mountains. And then you have the Pacific Ocean. So it's as if you have to go up and you have to go down. How do you do that? I want you to watch this video. So what happens is from the Atlantic Ocean, the ship comes in here and the gate closes and the, the water level is raised. So the ship raises up it, until it goes into the level two and then the gate closes and water fills up again until it goes into the lake. Then it sails on the lake and on the other side, the same thing happens and it comes down. So for every ship that goes through, you need 200 million liters of water to be pumped. 200 million million liters of fresh water to be pumped in here to facilitate the ship to go through. For every vessel, 200 million liters of water. So luckily, Panama has a lot of rainfall. So they have a lot of water, but now there was a drought. There was a drought recently. So what has happened now, they don't have enough water. So do you give water to your citizens or you give water to the Panama Canal, which is earning you so much money, $260,000 per ship. So initially they were allowing 36 ships to go through per day. Now it has come down to 18 ships because of the drought. Now this has a significance. Because of this drought, the waiting time for ships has increased. So some decide to go around South America and others decide to go on the Atlantic Ocean towards the Gulf of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean Sea. But then the problem is Babul Mandab. Babul Mandab, the Ansarullah sitting there attacking ships. So both ways it has become a problem. There's drought on one side and there's a political situation in the Red Sea. So the next economic corridor is the Gulf of Gibraltar. So you have Morocco here, you have Spain, and there's a small place here, it's called Gibraltar. Gibraltar, the word Gibraltar comes from the word Jabal Tariq. It's called Jabal Tariq became Gibraltar. Tariq bin Ziyad was a Muslim explorer, warrior, army commander who conquered this area. And of course, the Spanish took it back from him. But Gibraltar is a British colony. Just looking at the vitality of this corridor here, British have not let go of this place. So it's only 13 kilometers wide between Morocco and Spain. This width is only 13 kilometers long, 13 kilometers wide. And almost 300 ships pass through here on a daily basis going into the Mediterranean Sea. So Mediterranean Sea is very, very vital. So this is an economic corridor, but Gibraltar is a British colony. It's still under Britain. And just looking at the sensitivity of this area, and plus, if you see the normalization of Morocco with Israel, sometimes one would wonder why Morocco, where is Israel, where is Morocco, and why do they have to normalize? One of the reasons is this. You need somebody there who is reliable, not like the Houthis in Yemen. Just imagine if there was a problem in Babul Mandab and there was a problem here. The whole world economy would just collapse. So this area needs to be kept open at all times. Now this is an interesting one. This is another economic corridor and a very, very vital one. So you have the Mediterranean Sea. So one side of Mediterranean Sea, you have Gulf of Gibraltar. 
On the other side, you have the Red Sea going down through the Suez Canal. And on this side, you have the Black Sea. Black Sea, you have Russia, Ukraine, you have Crimea, which Russia has taken over from, from Ukraine. And there's a small path here. It's called the Strait of Bosphorus. And you know what town is this? Istanbul. So Istanbul has two parts. One part is in Europe, one, time, one part is in Asia, and there's a bridge. So Istanbul is the city that connects Europe to Asia. And you can see how vital this is. So the wheat that we use here, wheat, fertilizer, sunflower oil, and oil from Russia, and Ukraine, and the southern Russian states, it all passes through this area here. So you can imagine the power of this country. Turkey is very, very, very powerful. And of course, they charge a toll. So this is not free. For, so for every ship that passes here, and it's busier than Suez Canal, it is busier than Babul Mandap, it is busier than Panama Canal. So the number of ships that are passing through here, it's a very narrow area, but there's so much vital cargo for the world economy that passes through this small economic corridor. This is Azerbaijan. If you see, so you have Azerbaijan on one side here, very rich in oil. One of the longest pipelines has been laid down. So Azerbaijan to Baku, Tbilisi, and Seyhan, or Keyhan in Turkey. So this is an oil pipeline transporting oil from Azerbaijan up to Turkey. So Turkey has an economic corridor, but it also has this vital port in the Mediterranean Sea called Keyhan. And any guess, where is this oil going? Yes, 40% of Israel's oil supply is going from here into Haifa. Where is Azerbaijan, Turkey, into Israel? So this is a vital pipeline. And I just wanted to show you how vital Turkey is in the world economics. And what can they do? We'll come to the conclusion later on. There was another pipeline that was laid down between Israel and Kurdistan, which is not functional. And during Shah's time, there was another pipeline which was going all the way to Iran. All these are disabled. So this is a vital lifeline for Israel through another corridor, which is Turkey. So Azerbaijan is 80% Shia. Azerbaijan is 80% Shia, the second highest Shia population after Iran, Azerbaijan. But yet, they have close ties to the Zionist regime. Yes, so now this is the one that is very, very vital. The Suez Canal, which connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. It's in Egypt. Started in 19, 18, 1869, it was opened, 193 kilometers long. This path here is 193 kilometers long. And just imagine if it wasn't for this Suez Canal, ships would have to go around Africa, all the way around Africa, up to the Mediterranean Sea, through the Gulf of Gibraltar. Because of the Suez Canal, it reduces sailing times by six to 10 days and 6,000 miles. So instead of ships going through round Africa, you can see how vital this is, Suez Canal. And what is more vital, so Suez Canal crisis, 1956. I was not born at that time, but there are some, I don't know who remember. I met somebody in the mosque, and he clearly remembers the Suez Canal crisis. So this Suez Canal, it was so vital, again, controlled by the British and by the world powers at that time. And Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of 
Egypt decided to nationalize it. He says this Suez Canal runs through Egypt and it will belong to Egypt and the, the proceeds of the Suez Canal will go towards Egypt. And it was crisis. The moment he nationalized it, Britain, Israel and France attacked Egypt just to let go of this place. But luckily United Nations came in between and they say this was the fall of the British Empire. The British Prime Minister had to resign. For six months, the Suez Canal was closed. Six months the Suez Canal was closed, but the world economy was in shambles. That's how vital this is. For every ship to cross, any guesses what toll do we pay here? How much does every ship have to pay to cross through the Suez Canal? It's 400 to 700 thousand dollars. Every ship, every vessel has to pay 400 to 700 thousand dollars to go through the Suez Canal. So you can imagine, and all this goes to Egypt. So after the Houthis started attacking ships here, the traffic has gone down by 46 percent. The ships crossing Suez Canal has gone down by 46 percent. So you can imagine what is happening to Egypt now. You're losing out on so much revenue, the number of ships that are going through. And as you come down, you have Babul Mandab there. Red Sea, you come down and you have Babul Mandab, which is just 26 kilometers wide. So on one side you have Yemen, on the other side you have Djibouti. And this is where they've created hell. So initially, Ansarullah kept on warning that if the genocide in Gaza doesn't stop, we are going to do something very drastic. And then in spite of all their economic problems, they said we are going to attack all the ships that are going to Israel. But the world propaganda at that time the Americans and British came and said they're attacking all ships, so no ships are allowed to go. In reality, the Ansarullah were very clear. We are only going to attack the ships that are going to Israel. All other ships are free to pass. And at that time, I went to the Suez Canal website and I could see ships were going through. Yes, less ships, but the ships that were going to Israel were being attacked. But they changed through media, they changed it to say get all ships, so many ships stop sailing or they increase their freights, they increase their insurance premiums just to make use of the crisis. So now countries had to pay 200% more that there are time delays and so many more things. But more importantly, they wanted that resolution to pass in the United Nations saying that Yemen are threatening the maritime path and we need to attack them. So they started attacking Yemen. The moment they started attacking, now it was not only ships going to Israel, but all British and American flagships. All those ships that had decided to come from the Gulf of Panama, this way, British and American ships, they started attacking them. And this has caused a big crisis. The impact is big and we should not underestimate it. Thirty percent of the global container traffic passes through Babul Mandab. Thirty percent of the world's container traffic passes through Babul Mandab. This is a very important economic corridor. That whole war on Yemen, if you remember, was because of this. They couldn't stand a government which was not in their favor, which was not running on their whims because of this vital area here. Whoever is in control of Babul Mandab is in control of the world economy. And as it stands just now, it is the Yemenis who are calling the shots. You have the China Belt and Silk Road Initiative. So this is the power of China. This they started almost 10, 15 years back and these are all the economic corridors that they are working on. So this is the power of China now. You have the maritime routes running from China to Malaysia, to Calcutta, to Mombasa, all the way from the Red Sea into Europe. And then you have a railway and a road. 
So you have the road and railways up to Russia, through Iran, into Turkey, into Europe. So this is China's economic corridor, and that's why China is doing so well economically. They don't want any obstruction. And it, the, what they've done is they've created a win-win situation. So whichever country they go to, they say, we'll invest in your infrastructure. In return, you have to be part of this Belt and Silk Road initiative. And if there's a, there was one Strait of Hormuz, yeah. So Strait of Hormuz was mentioned there. I did not mention it. So Strait of Hormuz, this is very, very vital. 40%. No, sorry, 20% of the daily oil output of the world has to pass through Hormuz. From Bahrain, Kuwait, Iraq, Iran, UAE, it all has to pass through Strait of Hormuz. 40% of the world gas, so all of Qatar's LNG, liquefied natural gas, Qatar is a leading producer of liquefied natural gas. It has to go through Strait of Hormuz. This is one of the most vital economic corridors. It is almost 33 kilometers wide, but ships can only sail through three kilometers. It may look 30 kilometers wide between Oman and Iran, but actually ships can only go through three kilometers. And that three kilometers is on the Iranian side. So they have a dilemma. You can't sail on the Omani side. You have to sail on the Iranian side. So oil and gas. And there's no alternative to this. So you can imagine if Strait of Hormuz was closed, what would happen to the world economy? And that's why the Americans have placed their fifth fleet in Bahrain. There's a whole fifth fleet American army base in Bahrain and so many army bases around here just to prevent Iran from closing the Strait of Hormuz. Iran has never closed it. They've threatened so many times, but they have never closed the Strait of Hormuz. But it's a vital choke point. So in case of a world war, if there's an escalation of the Palestinian crisis, this could potentially happen. We discussed the China Belt and Silk Initiative. Iran have made their own route. So Russia and Iran were both sanctioned by the US. So along with India, they have made their own route. So Indian goods had to go from India into Babul Mandab, into the Red Sea, into the Mediterranean Sea, the Gulf of Gibraltar, into Europe and into Russia. So they came up with this initiative. So now from India, it goes straight into Iran, Chabahar port. From there, it is transported by road and railway into Russia. It is 40% faster. It is called the International North-South Transport Corridor. It is 40% shorter and 30% cheaper. So you can imagine this economic corridor that has been opened, it's a powerhouse between Russia and India. A very vital thing that was created. So, when the Americans saw the India China uh, Belt and Road Initiative, they came up with their own plan. And this was the plan that was presented by Benjamin Netanyahu in the United Nations in September. He says, this is the new Middle East. So it was unveiled in the G20 summit. So it would leave from India, go into Dubai, Jabal Ali, into Riyadh, up there, Jordan, and into Haifa, and up into Europe. And this was the plan that they're going to create this initiative. Nothing has been done. It was just mentioned. A budget was set, I don't know, billions of dollars. But this was to stand in rival, in rivalry to China, what China was doing. And this is what Netanyahu talked about, that we are going to have a new Middle East. He, he drew a map he, in front of everybody. He said, this is going to be the new Middle East. And he negated Palestine. So there was no Palestine on that map. And what he was talking about 
was the Ben Gurion Canal. So on this side you have the Suez Canal in Egypt. Their plan was from Eliad to go up and create another canal that would go through Gaza up into Haifa and they would have access to Mediterranean. If this was successful, if this was successful, Suez Canal would just die down. All the world maritime transport would go from here and that would make Haifa very, very popular. So this was their plan and it's one of the theories behind the war that is going on just now. So what October 7th did when Hamas attacked Israel, the first thing that happened was this plan just went down the drain. Even before it took off, this plan has gone down the drain. And so has this plan. The Ben Gurion Canal now might be in the dustbins of history. It doesn't look like it is going to happen. So, to cut, cut this long story short, I know I've spoken for too long, but a few conclusions from this. If you look at all the canals, other than the Panama Canal, the Strait of Gibraltar, the Suez Canal, Babul Mandab, the Strait of Hormuz, and the North-South Corridor, it is all in the hands of Muslim countries. Muslim countries are on one side or the other. And this just shows the power that Muslim countries have. If they do decide to do something jointly, it can bring any country to its knees. The Suez Canal crisis of 1956 was just an example. The oil crisis of 1977 by King Faisal was just an example to close the taps of oil. And it's enough to bring any country to its knees. But the problem is we don't have unity. All the countries are separate. They have their own policies. In fact, they are on the other side of history. And that gives the oppressors the audacity to do whatever they're doing. Number two, if you see these alternative pathways that are forming, the North-South Corridor and the China Belt and Silk Initiative, this is truly showing the decline of the US empire. Countries are doing things independently now. So it's the beginning of the fall. This is what the analysts say. Of this grand empire, this is the beginning of the downfall. Just like the closure of the Suez Canal was the fall of the British Empire of those days. This, they say there's something big that is going to come out from this. So the emergence of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, plus the other countries that have joined, Iran, Saudi Arabia, they are all in the, this alternative plan, although they're playing both sides. India is playing both sides, Saudi Arabia is playing both sides but it's definitely weakening of the US. The rising power of China and BRICS, and lastly, the impact of the October 7th and the Ansar Allah initiative. You can imagine October 7th is not restricted only to Palestine, but it has had a global effect. The global collective consciousness, there's an awakening, but the world economy is shaking because of a small attack by a small group on an oppressor, the effect is very big. And on the other side, you have Ansarullah, who are playing their role very well. They are also causing shock waves in the world economy, just playing around in the world economic corridors. Lastly, the war has not even begun. What we see now, the war has not even begun. Yes, we've seen oppression, but everybody is trying to prevent an escalation. When the war really begins, when more and more countries start getting involved, and the warnings are already there, the analysts are already warning, the heads of states are already warning, that if you don't behave, something major is going to happen. If, if there is an escalation, one of the first things that's going to happen is closure of these economic corridors. And if these economic corridors close, you can imagine what's going to happen to the world economy. So the signs are there is going to be an escalation. And if there is an escalation, tough times ahead 
for all of us. And that is what we need to understand. The big question is, what side of history are we going to stand on? Looking at what is happening, which side of history are we going to be? Are we going to hold on to a sinking ship or to an emerging ship? Only if you understand this will we be able to make the right choice collectively and it's important to make the right choice. Till then, our du'as are very important. Allah is watching. He's looking at our consciousness. Where is our allegiance? How much are we doing? It's the biggest imtihan that we have. Are we praying enough for the oppressed people of Palestine? They are heading this war. It is just the tip of the iceberg. They are facing the brunt. But are we doing enough for them? Are we standing behind them? This is the test of our time. May Allah give us the tawfiq to make the right choice, inshallah. My apologies if I have bored you. Thank you for listening uh, attentively. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.